welcome to JLab, a podcast from the Civic Journalism Lab. It's a forum for professional, student and community journalists in the northeast of England to meet, learn and collaborate. It's supported by Newcastle University and by BBC Northeast and Cumbria. My name's Ian Wiley and the focus of this podcast episode is photojournalism. We're going to spend the next half hour in the company of Joanne MacArthur, an award-winning Canadian photojournalist, campaigner and author. Joanne is best known for her We Animals initiative, a photography project that documents human relationships with animals. She was the subject herself of a 2013 documentary, The Ghosts in Our Machine, and is the founder of The Unbound Project, which aims to celebrate and recognise female animal activists. Joanne's work has been published in a variety of media, including The Guardian, Elle, Der Spiegel and National Geographic Traveller. Uh, Animals in the Anthropocene. And uh, funnily, I mean, I love this title. This is the title I use for a lot of my talks, but I've been told not to because I've been told that people don't know that word, Anthropocene, which is the proposed name for the current geological epoch. And I thought, no, no, everyone knows that word. And we put a thing out on Facebook. uh, Who knows what this means? And it was like less than 10% of people knew that word. Really? No, it's like my favorite word. Um, But animals in the Anthropocene, um, they they are who I photograph. And who is, you know, as opposed to it, we're so often uh, calling animals it. Uh, just one, one part of it here. But animals in the Anthropocene, that's not what I was always doing. Um, I started uh, taking pictures in 1998. And like many photographers, I was looking for my story, hadn't found it yet. I was really into street photography and war photography. And I managed to um, get an internship with Magnum, which was very influential. And you know, I wanted to, I wanted to do war photography and that kind of thing. And one of my mentors, Larry Towell, said, "No, that it's not you at all. Just do what you know. You know that famous advice: do do what you love, do what you know." And so, what I know and love is not, not just animals, but I have a, a major concern for animals. And I saw that there was a huge sector of animals who were completely invisible and unrepresented in uh, the media and in the world. And this, this was my story, these invisible animals, and so far that has taken me to almost 60 countries now, not just to photograph, but to speak about the animals, and it's been 15 hardcore years of, of field work. So who are these in, invisible animals? We actually have a very close relationship with them, and yet we fail to see them in our lives. It's, you know, unlike wildlife, who are very well represented. Uh, just like last night, I was at Wildlife Photographer of the Year at the Natural History Museum. Huge celebration of beautiful images of animals. We're very comfortable seeing those animals. Not so much the chickens, though. Same thing with pets. You know, there's a lot of pet photography. They're very well represented. But what about the food animals, who represent billions of animals every year, who who are you know, eaten and tortured and killed very painfully. And if we give them any thought of, at all, these invisibles, it's often as a part, not so much as a whole. You know, we might think of them as a wing instead of a chicken, or we might call them veal or leather instead of a calf. She's uh, 20 minutes old, still wet from birth, and the picture is self-explanatory. We might call them fur trim instead of a fox or a mink or a raccoon dog. Um, I go undercover uh, frequently. I do a lot of investigative work, and this is a picture I took at a uh, macaque breeding facility in Southeast Asia. We were posing as buyers of these monkeys. Um, That's how I gained access to that place. So they are, you know, the animals used in in medical research. They are the working animals. Ethiopia alone has five million working equines. It's pretty incredible. And they are the animals who are used in uh, religious practices and religious sacrifice. And interestingly, these invisible animals are often in plain view. And they are the animals we use for our uh, education, in quotes, that's a whole other topic, um, and for our entertainment. And so they are right in front of us, you know, at rodeos, bullfights, aquariums, that kind of thing. And yet they... Uh, There's plenty of barriers between us and them, aren't there? It's often glass. Uh, We're often there for our own amusement and not not for, you know, to actually see the animals. So 15 years later, uh, what I've done is created the We Animals Archive, which is is an unusual 
business model for a photographer. So what I do is I invest all of my time and money into creating these images so that I can give them away for free to anyone helping animals or anyone who's you know, writing about animal stories. And there's over 1,100 images now on the archive and video as well, and I'm able to do this because my project, We Animals, has, um, has, is donor-based now, which is fantastic. So grants and monthly donors, that kind of thing. Again, unusual business model, but um, I guess that's where the campaigning aspect comes into it. Uh, people call me an activist and a campaigner, and, and certainly I am. You know, I wear different hats, and I try and wear them more firmly depending on the audience, uh, because, you know, a lot of mainstream media will just dismiss me completely the minute they get this idea that, you know, I have an opinion on, these, uh, on this subject matter. Uh, but yes, making everything available for free, and I encourage anyone um, who needs images, whether it's bear bile farming or greyhound racing in Australia, and on and on, you can use this resource. Uh, this is a page from National Geographic. Photography is a weapon against what's wrong out there. Of course, it's bearing witness to the truth. Um, yes, just referring to my notes here. You know, uh, this, this whole, uh, you know, is, is photography, is photojournalism dead? I mean, I don't, I don't know how that kind of conversation can even happen. And maybe people feel really strongly about that. But, I mean, for me, it's still really an essential part of the puzzle when it comes to changing the world. I mean, there are many parts of that puzzle. They are, you know, political and legal. Um, sorry. But, um, I mean, f photography remains an essential part because how are we supposed to feel and connect unless we can see, right? Seeing, seeing these animals, seeing these situations is just absolutely important. And so what I see as what we're doing as photojournalists Whatever you're covering, I mean, it's historical. We are creating history, we're changing history, and with the animal work, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else right now because it's just really ramping up. I mean, what was what the media was not publishing five, ten years ago, they are publishing now. And so there's an even greater demand for the work that I do, which is why the We Animals Project is now becoming We Animals Media. So uh, what was, you know, a girl with a camera is now six of us. And Sally's here, she's one of our teammates. And uh, as we grow into We Animals Media, we're going to be hiring journalists, filmmakers, photographers. So it's actually a very, very exciting time to be covering animal stories. This is in um, a, a couple of quick examples of uh, work that I've been doing recently. This is in North Carolina, where there was no media covering the animal stories specifically. So in these factory farms, I mean, North Carolina has, oh God, like nine, I can't remember, like 900 million chickens and 9 million pigs, and uh, they're considered inventory. And what they did when the floods were coming and the hurricane was coming was just lock the door to those, to those barns and let the animals drown in the waters and in their own feces. Horrible deaths for millions of animals. And we, it was really hard to get close to these places. Um, one hog farmer's wife came out and said, if you get any closer to that barn, we're gonna, my husband's going to come out and shoot you, shoot you dead. And because of ag gag laws and because of all the guns there, I was like, okay, I believe you. And, and so these places are really hard to access and people aren't doing it because these animals are unseen, uncared for, covered by insurance. Um, and and these, um, the floods would uh, flood the, the, the shit lagoons, basically, which is what you're seeing there. Um, they have nowhere to put all the feces from the animals, and so they build these lagoons which overrun with the floods. And then they, you know, they just pollute the communities, they pollute the waterways, it kills wildlife. Talk about animals in the Anthropocene. That could be like the poster for that. Uh, these are surviving cows from the flood, just slowly starving and hoping people will bring them food. And it was quite incredible to be wading around in that sewage, in the pathogens. Uh, my filmmaker and I actually got sick while we were there from, from being exposed. And um, some of these barn doors, the, the doors would open, and so um, thousands of chickens were floating around. It looked like this. They were caught in bushes and fences, and I mean, they were everywhere. It was, it was just incredible, but the media was not there. And we were only able to get out there at all because we were tagging along with the dog and cat people. Uh, they were doing rescues, and that's, you know, acceptable. It's acceptable to go and help the dogs and cats in a flood, but not, <laughs> not all of the other animals. This would have been really hard to, to publish 
until recently. Um, the Guardian ran our story, and uh, actually it was picked up quite internationally, so, so that's good. I mean, even fish are affected by concentrated animal feed, feeding operations, CAFOs. Uh, this was a lake nearby. Now, uh, fish can die from floods because of the change in oxygenation in the water and the change in nutrients, but they will also die because of all the pollutants coming into the waterways. So here there were over easily over 100,000 fish uh, affected by the floods and affected by the, the pollution. This is Elsie Herring. She is a community member um, in North Carolina. Her family have been in this house, uh, not this house, in this community for centuries. Uh, she was the youngest of 15 children, and this is her home. She grew up in this home, but um, this was like, you know, beautiful land until the last couple of decades where CAFOs, uh, pig CAFOs, are just growing up everywhere around her place. And again, they're always trying to get rid of the manure and where to put it, and so they spray it on fields. But of course, when it's getting sprayed, it's going up into the air, um, it's causing illnesses in people and cancers, and so she walks around with this kerchief over her face. The CAFOs spray manure as close as eight feet away from where she's standing. It's really something. So there's just so many, so many issues, you know, with the... Um, with the animal problems, I mean, I'm, I was initially interested in the animal stories because of their sentience and wanting to protect them, but I mean, the story is, is very intersectional. It's about human health, it's about the, the health of the earth. And I, can, I really appreciate that more and more people are getting on board with you know, the intersectional aspect of this because all of these issues are very important. Uh, something else I covered this year was animals and transport. When we think of animals at all, you know, eating them, it, it might be, you know, like, oh, a, a pig in a field, or, you know, many of us are quite ignorant when it comes to the many levels of um, many things that they go through you know, before they get to the plate. For example, this is in Israel. This is a ship called the, the Bahija, and the Bahija is coming in from Australia to Israel. 22,000 animals on this ship. It's a total mess. There's death and carnage. And it's, a, it's just a very grueling trip for them, three weeks on the ocean, and the, the ship is just docking in Israel. And um, further to that, then they're loaded onto trucks, and they are transported for hours to uh, places like feedlots and quarantine. This is quarantine before they uh, go to slaughter. And uh, they're really roughly handled getting on and off these trucks, and you can see that this, um, this cow has his leg caught in that opening, and actually I was with some activists who stopped the truck and climbed up to that top level to, um, to move the animal's leg. I mean, he would have been like that for hours, and in cases like this, the legs are often broken, and that's just, that's just part of the business. So, yeah, like showing, you know, that showing the numbers is important. The numbers are staggering, but, you know, often I'm trying to come back to showing, showing a face and telling a bit more of a story so that we can connect with these individuals. And, I, I mean, if... If this wasn't dystopic enough, um, people in Israel are getting used to the bodies of animals washing up on their public beaches. And they just walk by them. You know, this is part of business these days because of all these ships coming into Israel. And so this is, um, this is the remains of a calf, and you walk along the beach, and this is the kind of thing you see. Interestingly, because these animals have tags on their ears which will trace the animal back to the ship, um, they cut the ears or the head off before throwing the dead animals overboard. So there are a lot of things to this system that, uh, that need fixing. Onward to Turkey, I went down to the Turkish-Bulgarian border this year where animals are uh, funneled from all across Europe down into Turkey for slaughter. And I went in the hottest months because that's when they're not supposed to be transported. It's illegal to transport them over uh, 30 degrees. And here you can see clearly that the, uh, the temperature is clocking 35 degrees here. And, and no one is monitoring these places. Again, I mean, it's the same thing with North Carolina. Like, no one's down there. And I, I find these stories very, very important. And uh, this is an image that kind of gives you a, an idea of the size, uh, these three floors of uh, trucks packed with animals. They spend days and days and days and days on these trucks. That's me uh, climbing up to the third level to get some images. The fans are not often turned on because it drains the battery of the truck. Oh my gosh, so frustrating. And though there is water available on the trucks, it's often not turned on or the barrels are full of straw or because these are animals who are new to each other and um, 
trying to find their place in the hierarchy, uh, the dominant animal will often uh, fight with the others and stay where the water is and basically block the water. So um, these animals go days without water. They've just been uh, released from a truck to go to the way station right now. And basically in this picture, they're, they're fighting over the little water that's available to them in the troughs. Uh, the calf is named Ibo. Ibo was named after the veterinarian who, uh, who saved his life, basically. The group I was working with, Eyes on Animals, uh, they monitor the trucks and all that's going on there. Um, they found him, and they don't know if Ibo was born on a truck or if he was born uh, in a way station, but he was not nursing and he was dying. He was having actually a, a miserable, long suffering path to death, so they gave, him, uh, they gave him veterinary care and he survived, which is bittersweet because, of course, you know, they, they saved him from a, a painful death, but his future is, of course, unknown. And Ibo, I mean, he's one of these examples of the animals, the, the things we don't think about when we think about the animals we eat. Uh, Susan Sontag writes in her book uh, regarding the suffering of others, who should be looking at suffering? And people really push back against my work because they do not want to be exposed to this. Understandably, it's painful, it's awful. I think it's awful for us, and we want to turn away, not because we're jerks. <laughs> I think we're compassionate, and I think that's why we want to turn away. But um, who should look at these? Well, I mean, she says, you know, anyone who can help. Right? And it's the same thing with humanitarian work. I mean, we see awful things, but we need to see them, especially if we can help. And when it comes to animals, we can all help. This is, um, and, you know, back to campaigning again. I, uh, my work goes out to organizations, and they do most of the campaigning. Hundreds of organizations every year use my work, and they put their slogans on it, and they do the shouting with the images. Um, I don't do so much of that. I think they, they shout loud enough on their own, but sometimes we have this tagline, which is very Canadian of me. It's very polite. <laughs> Please don't turn away. And so that, that is the, the we animals ask quite often. And it's so important to show the good as well as the bad. Very important, show the solutions, show the individuals. So I'd like to introduce you to a few of them. Um, and speaking of animals in transport, this is Jay, the steer. And he was the only survivor from a burning uh, transport truck. There were about 50 of them. Um, uh, the truck toppled and caught on fire and um, animals were burned to death and then some of them were shot and he escaped. And then he became, you know, that hero, that, that animal that everyone wants to save. Isn't that interesting? You know, like while we're eating animals, we're also like, oh, one wanted to live. Let's help that one live. So that's Jay hugging uh, his caretaker, Susie. And I, I mean, I love taking these photos, obvi obviously, <laughs> like the situations like this, but it's also important for us to see that we can have relationships like this with, you know, animals who are not cats and dogs. Um, this is Gene and Opie, and Opie was left for dead at a farm, but Gene rescued him, and they remained good friends for 16 years. What should we do? Can you carry on? Yep. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Um. Yeah. Um. You know. Again, meet, meeting the individuals and telling their stories. Portraits are. Portraits are lovely and they're important, but they can do more if there's a story behind them. Um, Echo the turkey was, uh, you know, next in line for slaughter, basically, for Thanksgiving. And anyway, he was rescued. And aren't they beautiful animals? I, mean, I think a lot of us just don't know how beautiful these, these animals are. Rachel and Shay, so I've spent a fair bit of time in Africa, and this is at a lovely sanctuary called Ape Action Africa. And Shay, on her back, was uh, orphaned by the bushmeat trade. And she raised him. She saved his life and raised him. And he's eight years old now in this picture. And uh, it's sweet. Like, he's just too big to be on his mom's back, first of all. But isn't it funny how he's holding her boob? <laughs> ha ha. Um, I am talking longer than I meant to, so I'm going to skip a couple of stories here. Um, yeah, Ron, uh, Ron was saved from research. Uh, he was kept in a five foot by five foot by seven foot cage suspended above the ground for about 30 years before his rescue. And at Save the Chimps, they have this beautiful ritual. When the chimpanzees die, they cremate them with a key, uh, symbolically, because chimpanzees who have been used in research uh, know what keys are for. 
they've seen them use. They, they follow you with the keys, and if they can, they'll swipe at your keys because they know what they're for. They, they know it's for freedom, and they know how to use them in the locks as well. And so Spock has just passed away on this day, and, uh, and they'll cremate him with that key. Uh, you should never get in a car with a gorilla. <laughs> Strongly ill-advised, but you might get a, an award-winning win, picture. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny. They will not transport animals like this in Europe or North America, you know. It's, but uh, in Africa, they're like, all right, we need to move this gorilla to the new enclosure. This is also um, um, an animal who's been rescued from uh, the bushmeat trade. And uh, uh, in the arms of her caretaker, his name is Apollinaire. And this image won one of the Wildlife Photographer of the Year awards, and it won another Humanitarian Peace Award this year. And it's funny because that is um, creating all of these opportunities for me to come and speak at wildlife conference conferences, but I'm not a wildlife photographer. People are like, what is she? Well, I don't know what to call her. So, I mean, I say that I'm a photographer not of animals, but for animals. They're, they're basically my clients. And uh, about the invisibility of animals, this is one of my earliest images from the We Animals Project, and I found it so interesting that, okay, this is the stupid dog trick contest, I should tell you. And his stupid dog trick is to put his dog's entire head in his mouth. And, you know, he won the, won the award for that. But also about, you know, what kind of photographer am I? Um, I'm photographing animals, but I'm really photographing our relationship with animals and how we fail to see them and how we fail to consider them over and over and over. And this is such an interesting example of that because look at all those people uh, basically just, you know, eating what they're told, being laughing because, you know, it's supposed to be funny. And so that's why I took the picture from up on the stage. I wanted to show the people. I wanted to show their reaction. And again, the animal is at the center. The non-human animal is at the center of this picture, and yet it's kind of like the afterthought. Uh, this is one of my most uh, well-known and well-used pictures of a rabbit next in line for slaughter. And um, yeah, maybe you know we'll talk about it more of like the the technical side of shooting in the workshop. Um, yeah, people often want like a lot of technical advice on you know how to shoot and how to get good images. But honestly, my advice is usually just get down and get close. Like wide angles are great for telling a story and showing a bigger picture, and uh, not needing words or de or description when when you get a shot like this. And yeah, solutions journalism and showing the uh, showing the good and showing the possibilities for change. So the Unbound Project, which is about women animal advocates around the world, um, basically highlights the good work being done by women, specifically because in animal advocacy there are a lot of men in leadership roles, probably worldwide there are a lot of men in leadership roles, and yet there are a lot of women doing the work. And so this, uh, this project celebrates these women. And of course we have the big names like Dr. Jane Goodall, uh, wouldn't be a project without her. But more importantly, we're really interested in photographing and telling the stories of people who are toiling away, doing incredibly hard work, but are you know unseen and uh, uh, not you know not getting all the awards. Like Limka Galintete, she's a first responder in South Africa, so she's the one who gets the phone calls at three in the morning and has to jump in the animal ambulance and uh, and go to the rescue. So we salute women like Limka. And uh, Cora Bailey, so Cora Bailey, I love this intersectional side of this, uh, this work as well. Cora loves helping animals, but knows that if she wants to help animals, she has to help people too, especially in the townships of Johannesburg. And, um, and so she works in the poorest parts. She works in the Randfontein dump. Now this is a municipal dump that houses, not houses, uh, where 400 people live. It's pretty incredible. So we show up there. Um, she didn't tell me until afterwards that it's so dangerous to go there that even the police don't go. <laughs> um, she knew I wouldn't have gone with her. Um, but she's welcome there because she's just such a giving uh, person to the animals and to the people. So here she is with a half-dead piglet that she's found. We end up scooping up the piglet. Uh, that's her son Moses that she's walking around with, and now she's found a, a dog that needs help. So we're just, I mean, I was just in awe being in this place and meeting these people. And Moses has picked up a, a very sick dog and brings the dog to, that, to the ambulance. And uh, this is not a sick dog. This is just a lazy dog uh, who needs vaccinations <laughs> and wouldn't move. So uh, Moses picked him up and brought him over to the, uh, the clinic. And the kids, 
who live there, um, they have you know cats and dogs and, and chickens and pigs, and they're very proud to look after their animals. And so here they are lining up to get uh, tick treatments and deworming and that kind of thing with their animals. And that half-dead piglet, well, uh, here she is on my lap on the way back to the clinic, and we really didn't think she was going to make it. Uh, spot the piglet. <laughs> so two days later, she's still alive. Uh, she's 400 pounds now. Uh, her name is Whammy. <laughs> And she made it. So, I don't know, everywhere I go, I just meet so many interesting people, uh, so many stories to tell. Uh, this project features politicians. I'm going to just skip through some of these. Uh, the Black Mambas, who are an all-female anti-poaching unit in South Africa. So they do humane education as well as anti-poaching. Uh, women entering the growing field of animal law. These are all on our website, unboundproject.org. And we have long articles and photo essays. It's really fun. Uh, Rabia Hawa, I love this. Um, she's the first female Muslim ranger in Kenya <laughs> for the uh, Kenyan Wildlife Services. And this is Dr. Theo Capaldo, uh, who was the former president of the New England Anti-Vivisection Society. And uh, here she is very appropriately with a rescued rat. And I, I do love this quote by her. It sums up a lot for me. It's all the same, really. The environment, women, children, civil rights, the animals, it's all about the same thing, compassion and doing what's right for everyone. And, you know, back to what we can do with photography. I love the camera. It is such a tool for change, a tool for engagement, a piece of the puzzle in all of the campaigning that's happening out there. And so, a few examples. Uh, because of images, we are contributing to helping to end tourism uh, that involves the use and abuse of animals. Uh, photography helps um, support sanctuary, rescue, and conservation efforts instead of zoos and aquaria. And so because of this kind of work, we will see the closure of um, all unaccredited and roadside zoos. We will see an end to puppy mills. Uh, these, see, uh, these are at uh, puppy mill seizures in Canada. We will see an end to trophy and sport hunting. We will see an end to bear bile farming, which is a, a horrible practice um, in Asia. Uh, this is a practice that's being banned uh, across China, finally, and Vietnam. And, um, and actually, this, uh, these are images at this fur farm that uh, it was an investigative work that became a dossier that was given to organizations which help close, uh, close this fur farm. And this place had the first criminal cruel, cruelty criminal charges for a fur farm in Canadian history. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, and often our work is evidence. And on and on. Um, you know, this is all part of helping end the humiliation of animals and circuses. We need to see images like this to be appalled and not participate. And our images can contribute to the end of captive breeding and the keeping of cetaceans and on and on and on, the end of experimentation about animals being called inventory. That's what this man is, is doing right now. He, we are posing as buyers, as I mentioned earlier, and he's showing us his product. Those are the words he used. And it's very hard work and it's upsetting work, but it is such important work because again, so few people are speaking up for these invisible animals. I'm glad more and more people are doing the work. I mentor uh, journalists, photographers, students every month or two. I'm always busy with Skype calls with people around the world who are saying, I want to do what you do. And so um, I'm glad because we need lots of you. And I came across this quote, which I, I find quite fitting about the work. Compassion hurts. When you feel connected to everything, you also feel responsible for everything. And you cannot turn away. You must grow strong enough to love the world, yet empty enough to sit down at the table with its worst horrors. I'm, I'm looking forward to the talk with you guys today, and we'll talk about you know, objectivity versus subjectivity. And I mean, always, I'm always happy to continue that conversation. I think it's an evolving one as well. You know, objective photojournalism was the law. It's, it's not anymore, and I'm very happy about that. Um, but I don't know all the rules. <laughs> we can talk about that. But um, anyway, that's the gist of it. Thank you very much. Do you need this, John? Yes, if you want, Do you want to. This? Well, just, just, before, um, yeah. just before you sit down, uh, John, just on that point about subjectivity and objectivity, 
Um, because amazing work. Thank you. On, on all kinds of levels. Uh, this isn't really working. I'm just going to shout. Um, and, um, and, and really exciting things happening in campaigning journalism and solutions journey we talked about. But for those of us from traditional journalism backgrounds, um, we, we're not used to that. We, we, we're, we're, we're trying to get our heads around the whole objectivity thing. I mean, can you give some examples maybe of, of, in your own work, where you've, you've, you've had to sort of maybe juggle the objectivity, subjectivity, well, honestly, sometimes it's just about there. I'm not juggling that in itself. I'm juggling how to present my work and to whom. Um, yeah, like with New York Times, I finally had this coveted 10 minute meeting with them, and I didn't stand a chance because he looked at the first picture in my portfolio, which was a portrait of a bear. It wasn't, you know, didn't look very campaigny. And he just started, he said, I eat meat, you know, and I was like, oh, I don't care, just l let's talk about the work, you know, and, and he became very defensive and he didn't look through the whole portfolio because he saw me as a campaigner, even though those weren't the initial images even. Um, and so, you know, I, I would never call myself an activist, even though it's quite clear that I am, uh, when I'm speaking with certain media and some of them see through it and some of them don't, but what am I supposed to do? Like I, I, do, I do have a clear intention. I, I want to change the world for animals. I want to make the world a better place for animals. So um, I've just, things are taking a while. Um, things, things are changing. You things are changing. Change. Yeah. With, with those media organizations, with the new media organizations. Yeah, and, and with um, The Guardian, they have this new series called Animals Farmed. I'm so happy about that because they're pushing the envelope. They're saying we need to look at these animals. We need to look at cruelty and laws and policy and let's show the hard images along with it. Let's not just talk about it. But they publish my hard stuff that people don't want to see. So thank you. And and doors are doors are being opened more and more. And sometimes it's not because of animal cruelty or animal sentience specifically, it's it's like, you know, the workers in the slaughterhouse or the environmental impact. And that's great. But those are all important issues. Let's let's look at them all. <laughs> whatever, whatever it takes. <laughs> You've been listening to J Lab, a podcast brought to you by the Civic Journalism Lab, in association with Newcastle University and BBC Northeastern Cumbria. I'm Ian Wiley. Thanks for listening.